This episode contains mature language and situations. Listener discretion is advised. You wake, standing on the doorstep of a beautiful mansion. The front door stands open. You can hear voices, music, so many, many people. You step towards the door. You have to know what's inside. You're lost. You have no memory of how you got here. It doesn't matter. Because now, you belong to... The Grey Rooms. Chapter 11, Ash Manor Terminus. What are we? When all is said and done, we are the sum of our choices. Our choices define us. And so my time at the manor, choice by choice, defined who I was, and what I would become. My early days in the Grey Room ended with the Warden's transformation. The third door, my torture in the barn, my respite, and the arrival of my son. It seems so long ago now. Months, perhaps years, passed for me inside those endless corridors. I adapted in my own way. I became a part of the project, just as management had hoped. I would enter a door, plummeting into a crucible of pain, forced to experience the many and varied extremes of the human condition. And then, I would inevitably die. Afterwards, I returned to the safety of the manor, to a world of endless hallways and empty platitudes. I did this again and again and again. It was just as Bob had said that day on the hearth porch. The story of a quest in the Grey Rooms is, when all is said and done, a simple one. Seasons at Ash Manor were the only indication I had of passing time. One day it would be warm and bright, the peak of summer. And on my next return it would be cold and dark, white powder blanketing the carefully manicured grounds beyond the manor walls. My interactions with the inhabitants of the manor took on a familiar, if not always, friendly regularity. If it was Alma, she and I would sit for tea. I would pet her dog. She spoke to me of her research, her goals. Samuel liked her after a fashion, and so I grew to like her as well. Bob, on the other hand, tried to use hollow words to soothe me. The secret conversation we shared in the stalls dimmed in my mind, and I could be bitter in the face of his kindness. Samuel disliked him immensely. Sometimes Todd would fill in. We'd share a drink in one of the dining halls or have a chat on a walk about the grounds. It was a pleasant change of pace. I learned of his past growing up in the soul system, 
and he was fascinated to hear of that ancient world's history as I'd learned it in textbooks. So far as we could tell, the places we hailed from had little in common, beyond a few proper names. Samuel said I liked Todd because the old man reminded me of my favorite uncle, and I had no grounds to argue. And then, some days, the warden would come to collect me. After that day in the barn, he never touched me, but his eyes roamed across me with a ravenous hunger. Bob had warned me that management feared what external interest might mean for the project. That there were other things which had a stake in the Grey Rooms. The incident with the third door, now receding into the past, represented a threat to their control. That was why the Warden had tortured me so terribly. And why he was my escort from time to time. A guardian, but not to protect me from these beings. He was there to protect the project from what they might do with me, or through me. My final companion, of course, was my son, Samuel. In life, we'd had a tempestuous relationship. He was kind and brilliant, but he was also weak and sensitive. He'd failed to grasp the nuance or scope of my work. He refused to see my point of view on any subject, his own father. Every time I returned to Ash Manor, the shade, the specter of my dead son was there, waiting. He'd have a sympathetic smile on his face, eager to hear about the horrors of the rooms. Somehow, telling Samuel about what I'd experienced made it easier. Just a little bit easier. And that was enough. I told him about that horrific war, the mud and the trenches and the endless wall of rats. I told him about the vast facility beneath the ice, a prison full of horrors birthed in the depths of a lab. I tried not to shake as I told him about the horrors of the hospital, where a dread spirit stole my living body. With tears in my eyes, I recounted to him the insanity of the rows upon rows of artwork in that madman's workshop. There were so many, many stories to tell, and I endured them all. Because each time I returned to the manor, my son was there, waiting for me. I had a cup of tea or a stiff drink, and with a grim smile on my face, I opened another door and did it again, and again, and again, until finally, one day. I don't understand your fascination with this man, man. He's ridiculous, Dad. Look at him. No one is that tall. Later, son. Later. Did you say something, Admiral? No. No. I was just marveling to myself that this place exists. I had no idea you were such a book out. Each attendant is allowed their own space within the rooms for various projects. This is mine. So these tomes are all filled with... haiku? Not all of them are penned in my hand. I've collected a number of books from... various places since the start of the project. Hmm. Interesting. I very much doubt you wanted to see my book collection, sir. What did you want to talk about? Well... And, I should warn you, there is nowhere in Ash Manor where we are truly alone. Ah. Point well seen. I... Uh, I understand, but... I have something important to tell you. I just... really don't know how to say this. I still think Nama is a better choice, but this is the simplest way forward. Tell him, just like we practiced. 
Uh, Other men would be afraid. There's been a uh, development, and I wanted to ask you what the correct course of action might be. Go on. You recall quite some time ago now, you gave me a connection to the rooms. Yes. We had hoped it would convince you to work with us. Instead... Disaster. And the Warden's tender ministrations. Quite. Why do you bring it up? It... well... I don't know how else to say this. It's back. What's back? The connection to Ash Manor. That clear, thin line. It's returned. I can feel it. That's not possible. I imagine that you might say something like that. But it's true. I felt it. Creeping slowly back into my head. Just now downstairs, when we were discussing my rooms, I could see it. As clearly as I see you before me. Show me. Are you sure? If I'm going to talk to management about this, I'll need to see it for myself. Show me. Which room caught your eye? Last train sounded. Interesting, if nothing else. Very well. Picture it. Find the line in your mind. Lead me there. I won't stand in your way. He bought it. All right, follow me then. I'll get you there. Very well. Let's go. Just like I promised. Here we are. I had no idea the manor had a train station. Nor did I, frankly. What's the sign here on the wall? Ash Manor Terminus. You'll have to give my compliments to the architect for her sense of humor. Yes. Hmm. An attribute she's well known for. Do you believe me now, Bob? I have no choice now, do I? The question becomes, what do we do about it? Is she watching us? No, not at the moment. We attendants can tell when her eyes are upon us. It appears your room is arriving. What should we do? For now, nothing. Enter your room. I'll give this some thought, and we can speak again when you return. There has to be some way we can discover why this is happening. Preferably before we speak to management. I found presenting a problem without an accompanying solution is a reliable way to experience the full brunt of their displeasure. Sure enough, they're on the door. Last train. How droll. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for listening, Bob. I know we haven't always been on the best of terms. What I told you that day in the barn was true, Admiral. I have no wish to lose another guest. I am your attendant, after all. I'll see you when I return, then. Indeed.
did great. It was a family effort. You were right, of course. The simplest option was the correct choice. I think he genuinely believed me. Why wouldn't he? You've been a model prisoner for years now. Hmm. Prisoner. A much more honest term than guest. That's what makes this choice so... clean. Honesty is a weapon for you expect you to wield. Tell a man a knife is a gift as you plunge it into his heart, he'll thank you for it. And ask for another. Well said, sir. It's taken so long, but we've achieved something great today, son. This was just the first step. With you at my side, there are many, many more to come. Chapter 12, Investigations and Manipulations. Thank you, Todd, but I really could have found my way here on my own. I know what you said, Sir Barber, about your head being all connected to the rooms again and such like. Uh, uh, Miss Alma was adamant I at least walk you over, so here I am. <laughs> uh, make sure nothing slithers out of the door and gobbles you up, eh? <laughs> I take it back, Dad. He's even weirder than Uncle Jim. I appreciate it. Do you want to stay and help me look around? I do. I do. Maybe, maybe next time. Yeah. Uh, between the warden and the mizzle, I've got a chore list as long as, uh, well, <laughs> it's long, so, <laughs> yeah, so I've got to get after it. I understand. Next time, then, I'll hold you to that. We can have a drink afterwards. The lavender dining room, perhaps. We haven't been there in months. Sounds lovely. I'll be by again in a bit to escort you to your door. Yes. Right away, sir. I'll call when I know more. I can't imagine he's pleased. That, my dear, would be a dramatic understatement. Are you sure the Admiral's connection has returned, Bob? I saw it with my own eyes, ma'am. He never strayed from the path. Hmm. Where is the subject now? Todd just dropped him off in the North Hall. He's continuing one of his little investigations. I'd just like to say again how hollow I think that pretense is. The Admiral has been looking for that snake for years now. It keeps him busy and focused. What can it hurt? The Admiral is no fool. The very fact that he is allowed to go wandering unattended no doubt tells him what we think of his efforts. He most likely will learn nothing, yes. And if he does learn anything, the architect will see it, be able to review it, and we will know it as well. He is intelligent. Driven. With respect to you both, I think you underestimate what he's capable of.
All right. You practiced this a hundred times, Dad, just like I showed you. My hand's up like this. Good. Now hold the knife just so. Blood is the purest way to do magic. Even a little can do wonders. Just a shallow cut on my palm. And... Alduria. Baldush. Balaka. Did it work? I think... Dad! You did it! For as long as it lasts, they won't be able to see what you're doing. <sighs> did... Look. The cut. It's already healed. <laughs> it's taken months, but we'll make a warlock out of you yet. Well done. I wish I understood how you know how to do this, son. I do too. It's frightening sometimes. What I know. Things I wish I didn't know. Yes. Well, you're my secret weapon. With you at my side, I know. I know I'll get out of here. Come on. Let's get to work. Alma, what have the texts said? Do you have any notion as to what might have caused this? Every thesis I could get my hands on agrees. By removing the runes here in operations, he should be disconnected from the runes. Then, how? And after all this time, something must have changed. But what? Bob, have you spoken to the Warden? We'll need to book the Admiral for another session in the barn. We need answers, and we need them soon. Since the incident in the driveway, it's been difficult to locate him. That appears to be how he wants it, for now. Even if the Warden was available, I don't think it's wise to attempt another repeat of the barn incident. All we really learned was just how resilient the Admiral is to pain. Beckett reported to me as soon as he was sure the connection was real. He didn't have to do that. He could have hidden it from us. If we want answers, I think we need to look elsewhere. What? What is it? Alma. Would you give us the room, please? Of course. Thing? No, Bob is smarter than I thought. It wasn't this wing after all. How did he know to cover his tracks? He's clever. He must be to have survived this long. Clever, but weak. I get the feeling something happened to him. That woman, Samantha. Something about the way they talk about her. Hmm. But then that's why we need to find that study of his. Everything I want to know is there. I'm sure of it. This was the last wing to search, Dad. Bob must have done something to the rooms the day we were in there. Something that hid its true location. <sighs> huh. Perhaps. Perhaps Todd could be of help to us in our investigation, after all. Weird Uncle Jim? How? 
We go to him with evidence that the intruder somehow got in through Bob's library. I tell him. I tell him I think it must have been an accident. A mistake. And that we need to get into the room so we can clear Bob's name. Todd has a soft spot for the attendant. It's a weakness, son. One we can use. Brilliant. I don't know about that. But if we get inside, it will take us one step closer to the truth. To the truth behind the Grey Rooms. Bob. Ma'am. It seems as though something is amiss. I'm not sure what you mean. We have worked together for some time now, you and I. Overseen several iterations of the rooms. You have attended dozens of guests. Why is Admiral Beckett any different? I don't believe I'm treating the Admiral any differently. You are, Bob. You are. You were much, much harder on Miss Winters. And for far smaller infractions, much less dangerous circumstances. I... I don't believe that's true. We had an intruder in the Grey Rooms, and you were reluctant to use torture to get answers. Our guest is somehow reconnecting himself with the arcane forces that hold the manor together. And you're worried we're being too harsh on him. If our investors were not so keenly watching our progress, I would put an end to Ash Manor this instant. The subject has performed well. Our returns have been excellent. But nothing is worth jeopardizing the safety and security of the project. Nothing. You are one of the pillars of the Grey Rooms, Bob. I trust you. More than that, I like you. Tell me I have nothing to worry about. Tell me that you have a handle on this. You have nothing to worry about. I have a handle on this. Good. Good. I want you back in top form. Keep the guest in line. No more incidents. Or, well, as I said, I am unable to discard this guest and start fresh. So if steps need to be taken, I will have to take them elsewhere. High standards, Bob. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. Very good. You may go. High standards. Indeed. Chapter 13 The Man from Dome 33 Always a something of a surprise when I come back to life. 
<laughs> not a bad surprise. No, it's just, just, just a bit shocking. <laughs> oh. <sighs> oh, I've been killed so many times now. Uh, in an equal number of weird and mysterious ways, I might add. <laughs> it always gets kind of boring. Yeah. Ah. First time, uh, uh, well, back when I was alive and all, uh, was when I was shot in the heart by my third wife. Yeah. <laughs> I used to be pretty mad at her after I woke up in the end of the room. Uh, or not me, I guess, but... Uh, he looking back on it, I probably had it coming, you know what I mean? <laughs> she had caught me the legs of Kimbo and her sister and all. <laughs> <laughs> all right, then you, then you know, he's like I told the Emperor. Uh, my time with the project was as bad as anyone. Um, poison, knives, chainsaws, dogs, dogs with chainsaws, scalpels. Alien stingers, android finger blades. Oh, and this is one time. Oh, 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 a clown with a blowtorch. Oh, not a picturesque ending to that birthday party, let me tell you. Oh, still giving me the willy. Oh, oh. Well, even after I retired, I still got killed all the time. An occupational hazard of being the warden's favourite, I suppose. <laughs> Now, uh, thankfully, I, I die a whole lot less often than I used to. Uh, most nights, I can fall asleep here in my comfy little cottage in the manor grounds. I get to wake up in the same place, with all my limbs and wobbly bits intact. <laughs> Make myself a nice cuppa, get rested, and uh, go into work. Uh, uh, but, uh, hmm, how did I die yesterday? Oh, right, oh, right, yeah. The Waldens. <laughs> I should have guessed. Odds on favourite. Uh, Ms. Alma asked me to go looking for him again. I must have found him for all the good he did me. <laughs> I really thought he was turning the corner, he was. Uh, after they pried all those chains off him and made him wear a suit. Blinking Nora. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter, because today it's going to be a better day. I can feel it. <laughs> <sighs> You got a whole day ahead of you, Todd old boy. Embrace it. Breathe it in. Let's have a smasher. I'll spend most of the morning just doing my ketchup, Georgia. You know, you know it's amazing, it's amazing to me, but remarkable even, how these immortal, infinitely powerful hell beings need someone like little old me just to function sometimes. <laughs> oh, I gave the architect's bird cage a good cleaning. <laughs> I only got a couple of scratches for me trouble. <laughs> I helped, I helped Miss Alma with one of her experiments. I'm a very good test subject, if I do say so myself. <laughs> and I kept both my eyebrows this time, which was nice. <laughs> Afterwards, I gave little Oz uh, Alma's doggy a nice walk. <laughs> it was supposed to be a walk anyway. It got a bit excited. You know how pups 
Oscar B. <laughs> Afterwards, I had a bit of extra time to make lunch today. The Admiral was still sleeping off his last room and I um, wouldn't be expecting help with his investigations until the evening. So I decided to treat myself a bit and make me and the attendants some chilli for lunch. <laughs> Oh, but Bob don't actually need to eat food, of course, like they do it uh, sometimes just to make the guests feel at ease. Or, or if old Todd slaps some grub up and asks him nice and proper. <laughs> hmm, quite tasty. Delicious. Thank you, Todd. <laughs> oh, it's nice to be appreciated. I made chilli the way my first wife did, back in good old Dome 33. Dome, sweet dome. <laughs> oh, my Alice. <laughs> she was the best cook out of all of them. Taught me everything I know. Such a, a lovely caring sort she was. <laughs> I, 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 try, I, I try not to think about her much on, on account of, you know, she was the one, she was the one what broke me. <laughs> in, in the grey room. Time, the management said the statistical odds of a locust returning a subject to their point of origin are astronomical. That's fancy talk for the uh, rooms aren't supposed to take a guest back where they came from. But with me, lucky old me, they did. I chose a room. Inside was my Alice. I had to sit there in my ex-wife's head and watch as a maniac caught her up in a sweep. There were bad times around then. Lots of domes losing power, running out of food. Raiders got into work in domes, places full of families and good honest folk. <sighs> I was inside my sweet ex-wife's head when they brought her to their cook shop. Bodies hanging everywhere. She was so scared. And they, uh, they started cutting on her. She, she was, she was still alive when they started to eat her. Oh, I went, well, I went, I went full barmy after that, didn't I? I came out of the room screaming and swinging, went after Bob the Warden, and anyway, anyone that got near me, they had to kill me, of course, and... Even after I came back, I was too much of a nutter to go back in the rooms. I was done for as a guest. The first thing that, well, that really drove me crazy, the thing that still sets my teeth to rattling if I think about it too much. I chose it, didn't I? You choose your door. Being how the project has worked since day one, as far as I can tell, long before I came on. So back then, I, I had another option. I, I could have chosen a different room, another death. I guess it's like the Admiral says, we are our choices when it all comes down to it. <sighs> what on earth? Hello? Oh, it's you. <laughs> oh, I thought it was going to be the architect calling down to curse me out for taking a breather or something. You know how she can be. Well, it's been a couple of years now, hasn't it? Why are you asking now? Look, if they don't already know it was me to let your snake thing in, they ain't ever going to figure it out. Oh, good. It's in the usual place then, out in the woods. Yep, 
I'm squirreling them away for a rainy day. <laughs> Never know when you need to splash a little dosh around, eh? No, 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 nothing new to talk about, really. Uh, the Admiral's definitely talking to himself when he thinks no one's listening. Now, I, I confirm that. I'm not sure who he thinks he's seeing, but there ain't nobody there. I was thinking maybe it was my last thing. Oh, speaking of the devil. <laughs> the guest is awake. I've got to go fetch him and I'll get him sorted. Uh, we'll talk later, all right? Yeah, you too. He came in wet and sticky this time around. You get a feel after a while for which rooms will send him back in a state. His last one with a weird cup. The Admiral's a sensitive type under the skin. He came back all shaking and pissing himself. Oh, I was ready for him, though. Thank you again. These clothes will make for excellent replacements. I'm sorry for... well... The state I was in. Not to worry, Admiral, not to worry. I like this nice red coat on you. All quite dashing, I think. <laughs> You're good to me, Todd. I know we need to go find the attendants, choose a door, all of that. But before we do, I was wondering if I could cash in that rain check from you. Oh, your investigations again, yeah? Still eager to figure out where that creepy snake came from. <laughs> I have a theory. Todd, and, well, it's challenging. As he talked, uh, he kept glancing off to the side. He, he tried to hide it like, like, he was, uh, you know, like he was looking at me or something. They weren't. He was looking at something behind me. Only I knew there was nothing behind me on account there was a mirror on the wall. Stranger and stranger. Since I regained my facility to connect to the rooms, I've been able to track the snake much better. I've walked all around this old heap, following its trail, and, well... You've been in Bob's study before, correct? In my head, I giggled a bit. Oh, I says to myself, this is where this has all been heading. <laughs> Out loud, I said, oh yes, sir. I've been there a couple of times. Lovely place, quite cosy. What would you say if I said I had reason to believe the snake came in through the study? No, not all. Bob, no, he'd never! No, no, I don't think he would either. I don't think it was intentional, whatever happened. I don't believe Bob would deliberately work against the project. The problem is that right now my evidence is all circumstantial. I'm hesitant to bring it to anyone's attention. You're a good man, Mr. Beckett. You don't want to throw suspicion on Bob if you don't need to. That's quite decent of you. Thank you. Now, if you'd be willing to show me where it is, I think a few minutes in the library would prove or disprove my theory. With that out of the way, we can talk to the attendants directly. Have them bring this to management. Oh dear, our uh, connection with the rooms doesn't show you where it is. Then, oh, how strange. His look in his eye went hard for a moment. A bit scary. I thought I pushed it too far, but his look slid over my shoulder towards whatever he was looking at, and he forced himself to smile. It must still be settling down. I can't seem to find it. Even though I've been there before. Well, then don't you worry, Admiral Beckett, sir. I don't want anybody thinking Bob might have had something to do with that snake nonsense. Oh, let's get over to the north wing, and I'll show you just where it is. Oh. Oh, I forgot a key to get through locks and wards and touch. <laughs> locks and wards, you say? Oh, sure. You know how these attendants can be. Can't let just anyone go wandering into their sanctum sanctorum now, can we? <laughs> I suppose not. Well, lead the way. I nodded and headed down the hall. The Admiral followed along behind me, two little mortals and... One invisible whatever it was making their way through the belly of the big scary esque manor. Oh, I almost forgot. Bob would have had my head if I didn't ask. Ask what? Do you have any favourite foods, Admiral? Chapter 14 
My Dinner with Bob, reprised. tried to get used to this. Tried and failed. That moment of pain and anguish. The disorientation. The sensation that I'm falling. And then I land again on the floor of Ash Manor. My door closing behind me. At least now with Samuel here to greet me, the rooms are just a little bit kinder. Welcome back, sir. I looked up into his face and I saw the promising young cadet I remembered him to be. His uniform was clean and pressed. His kind smile reached his eyes as he looked down at me. If it wasn't for the fact that I could see right through him to the ancient clock hanging on the wall, I'd have reached out my hand. I could have used the help standing up. (sighs) Thank you, son. How was it? Terrible. And disturbing. I have some news. While you were gone... Ah, Admiral. There you are. I'm sorry I wasn't here to meet you. Not a problem, Alma. Not a problem at all. I'm glad to see you. We have something of a surprise for you. Oh? What's that? Well, it wouldn't be much of a surprise if I told you. Do you need some time to refresh yourself? No, I, uh, I'm fine. Excellent. Please follow me. Dad, listen. While you were gone, I spent some time examining the wards on Bob's study. I think together, the two of us can open the door without Todd. But I'll need some time to keep working without interruptions. Ask her if Todd and Bob are going to be at this surprise. Oh. Um. Are Todd and Bob going to be part of this surprise? They are. They're waiting for us in the hearth porch. Excellent. Great. While you're off getting surprised, I'll get this figured out. I'll see you after, all right? Making sure I was out of Alma's line of sight, I nodded to the boy, flashed him a quick grin. He smiled back at me. Something around the eyes reminded me so much of his mother that my heart pained with loss. He turned away and walked back up the hallway, and I followed my attendant deeper into the endless halls of the manor. Let's see, sir. Everything is in its place. Table settings, glasses, cutlery, music. <laughs> the sideboard is heaping with food and drinks. <laughs> A lovely spread, if I do say so myself. <laughs> well done, Todd. Uh, Miss Holmes on her way with the Emerald? Yes, she is. Oh, if you don't mind my saying so, Bob, I think this is a splendid idea. <laughs> what with things going all hibbity jibbity again, you know. <laughs> a nice meal will get us all centred and quiet like again. That is the hope. If, uh, if you don't mind my asking. <sighs> out with it, man. Will you. will. Were you thinking of uh when you were planning this? Uh, uh, Miss Winters, I mean. Uh, a dinner like you planned for her. I don't know what you're talking about. Of course not, sir. Never you mind. Uh, 
What's all this? A dinner party in your honor. Oh, it's uh, something of a tradition now. Uh, you've been with us for a while now. Indeed. And, despite a number of challenges, your time in the rooms has been a fruitful one. Is this why you were asking me what sorts of food I like, old man? Oh, <laughs> guilty as charged. <laughs> we have a bunch of information on what you like from, uh, uh, you know, b before. But I thought it would be good to ask, you know, just see if there was anything we missed. This is... <sighs> you all do know this is very strange, trying to make your prisoner like you. But... I have known you all now long enough to appreciate the spirit in which this is presented. And so, thank you. Thank you, Admiral. Well said. Well said, and the feed is on. <laughs> Everybody grab a plate, let's dig in. <laughs> I don't know what it is. This really is amazing, Admiral. You'll have to give me the recipe. Call me David, Todd. It's well past time. Well, I'll be damned. I think this fella likes me. To be fair, he has not known you that long. <laughs> Old sourpuss. <laughs> well, have some of David's chili there. You saw you at. Hmm. I'm not sure which I like better. The Admiral's or yours, Todd. Ah. See, that's very interesting, Alma, because I fully contend what Todd mixes up and serves can hardly be called chili at all. Oh, crikey, this again. Look, this is plenty good, uh, yes, sir, but, but the way I learned, it was all spices and peppers and meat. Beans I ain't got no place in my chili. How can it be chili without beans, man? They play the perfect accompaniment to the heat. I'll have you know my Alice was the chili queen at home 33 she was. Used to win all sorts of kinds of competitions. And I'd never dare to disrespect your Alice. But facts are facts as I understand them. You want to talk chili madness? One time, oh, oh I hate to even think of it. Oh, one time I went into a room, into the, uh, oh, what you call them, Miss Alma? A, 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 a locust. A locust. Oh, right. One of, one of them. Yeah. Uh, I went through a door, and on the other side, I sat down in this diner, and the other me ordered chilli, right? Uh, but, but what they brought out, oh, oh to both, it were all spiced with cinnamon. Then they poured it over pasta. What? I know. The craziest damn thing you've ever seen. How bizarre. Putting aside the chili, Alma, this has been a subject of conversation between Todd and I several times. These locuses. Oh, how so? Well, Todd here comes from planet Earth in the soul system. Except for his fine carved hand there, he's the spitting image of what I know people of that world to be like. Damn right. Now, we're obviously the same species, and our people both call themselves human. But when Todd and I compare notes, the history of his world is very different than the history I know of that pale blue dot. Some of the technology I'm familiar with was well beyond what Todd's clanmatron would have used to keep his dome safe. Moreover, in some of the rooms I've seen some very strange things indeed. Dark entities that make even the magics you wield seem cuddly by comparison. Societies that seem to work out very differently than either of ours, even technologies I've never seen before. I know there are things you can't tell me, but I'm just so curious. How is this possible? Hmm, Bob, what do you think? I think, hmm, I know that management is listening. Perhaps I shall address them. Ma'am. I believe he has a right to know some of what he's asking. He is as much a part of the program as we intended. The moment you feel uncomfortable with this inquiry, 
You need only ring the telephone here to put an end to this conversation. Silence is, as they say, golden. You may proceed, Alma. Just tread lightly. Hmm, all right. Let's start very basic. It's not that I don't think you're smart enough to understand, Admiral. But things get very complicated very quickly. All right. What is the definition of a locus? It's... a place, isn't it? It's always made sense to me in that context. The doors take you to a specific place and time. Yes and no. When we're talking casually, that definition is sufficient. But from my perspective, I'm using the word locus in a more mathematical sense. Mathematical. A locus is a set of points whose location satisfies or is determined by a set of properties. I'm afraid you've lost me. All right, we'll use a visual aid. This plate of cornbread, which is very good, by the way. Thank you. My wife Amanda used to make it to accompany my chili. Let's set it here. And then we have these chocolate croissants. A treat from your academy days, if I recall. Yes. They served them at the mess when I was a cadet. A favorite. The cornbread and the croissants, side by side. What do they have in common? Ah! <laughs> Besides the fact that they're both delicious, Todd. Oh. They're both... baked goods? Yes, exactly. What else? I mean, they both use a sort of milled grain. But... Uh, I think I see what you're driving at. I'm from a specific place. One which can be described by certain properties. So I'm from the cornbread locus, but Todd is from the croissant. Both baked goods. Both equally good on the dinner table, but because of their specific properties, they end up completely different. Very good, Admiral. To take that even a step further, look at the croissants. What if you were to change just one property about it? You wouldn't even have to change the recipe, just... Use a different type of chocolate or a finer milling on the flour. The results would superficially seem very similar, but in the specifics, two chocolate croissants could be very, very different. The devil is in the details, Admiral. <clears throat> I am assuming you have talked over some of your rooms with Todd. Yes. Did you tell him about... I believe it was the room you chose the day you met me... Bad harvest. What? No, I didn't. Should I have? Oh. Well, I, I were in that one too. Back in my day. Wait. The rooms repeat? No, they do not. But you just said... But Bob, I remember that room. It was horrible. I'll never forget it. I wish I could. I know. That's why I brought it up. Admiral, on the farm you were a man at the end of his rope. You were murdered by the vengeful spirit of your dead wife. I remember it vividly, just as Todd does. What was the farmer's name? Jack. His name was Jack, I believe. And in your room, Todd, what was the farmer's name? Uh, he, he weren't, sir. He weren't named Jack. In my, my room, his name was Luke. One locus, with small permutations, then. Change the ingredients ever so slightly, and you get a different outcome. Bob, how, how, how come, what, what didn't I know about this? You have learned this and forgotten it many times, I am sorry to say. But... If that's... If that's true... Damn it. Bob, if that's true, that means... That means my Alice... She's, she's out there somewhere in the rooms! 
dying again and again. Not just the one time I saw it, it happens every time. No, God damn it, Bob! Why the fuck did you kill him? I am sorry, Admiral, but it was for his own good. How was that for his own good? Tomorrow he will awaken in his lodgings, good as new, and he will not remember the conversation we have just been having. Trust me, Admiral, it is for the best. He told you about his last room on the project, I take it? Yes. You bastards made him experience his wife's death firsthand. It was an oversight, an error that has been corrected in how the rooms operate. It ended Todd's time as a guest, yes. But it was his subsequent realization, on a later iteration of the project, that locuses can be used again and again. Well, it drove him quite mad. Why? What are they for? What are you people doing? Why am I here? Yes? Yes, ma'am, of course. Our conversation is at its end, I'm afraid. <clears throat> I don't suppose you'd like to have anything else to eat? You people sicken me. Me. May, may I be excused? I have already chosen my door with Alma. Personal Best was its name, I believe. Of course. I can show you- No. I'll find my own way. Dad! There you are. I was just coming to meet you. What's happened? I'll tell you on the way, son. Tell me quickly, did you find a way in? Can we get into Bob's study? Yes, I... I did it. Between the two of us, we'll be able to open the door. Good. Because I am done with these people. I am done with this torture. I am done with the Grey Rooms. Chapter 15 The Problem with Free Will Dad, he's at the door. Good. This has been a long time coming. Stay close, son. I'm not going anywhere. Good evening, Admiral. Bob. I see you've made yourself at home. I have. You came straight to the study the moment you returned, I assume. You assume correctly. Hmm. Is it worth asking how you got past the locks and wards on the door? You've kept so many secrets from me. This one is mine. Hmm. I've made good use of my time. 
There's a great deal of interesting reading here in your journals and your tapes. <clears throat> well then, if we're going to have this conversation, I need a drink. You don't seem particularly surprised to see me. Should I be? I know what an explorer you are. I've been hiding your wanderings from management since almost the beginning. Hmm. I thought as much. Why? Admiral, I'll make you a deal. For as long as this conversation lasts, I'll be completely honest with you. All of my... what's the expression? Cards are on the table. In return, I'd like you to be honest with me. Deal. All right then. To answer your question, I hid your explorations to avoid even the possibility that management would deem you unfit for the program. I had every reason to believe the loss of another subject would be blamed on me. Like Samantha Winters. The loss of Miss Winters was a crushing blow to the project. She was by far our most successful guest to date. There were a number of extenuating circumstances, but... The Architect is well known for having high standards. I couldn't afford to have your eccentricities draw too much attention. It's interesting you describe me as eccentric, Bob. That is a word I would have reserved for Miss Winters. Even I find it all a bit distasteful. Do you blame a cat when it plays with a mouse? I could, so I didn't. I was a god. Well, you're no god here, are you? Yes. And it's a bit of a bitch, Bob. Fascinating. So you don't regret it? Any of it? I only regret it's over. Happiest time of my life. All of our guests have... Troubled pasts, yourself included, Admiral. But you knew that, didn't you? Once you realized where your memories were leading, you asked Alma to shield you from the truth. Have you listened to your own interview tapes? I have. It was not terribly pleasant. Do I hear a tremor in your voice? A shame. You were made of sterner stuff back then. Oh, don't think my will is failing me now, Bob. I've succeeded where so many others have failed. I know everything. A toast to your success then, Admiral. Tell me. You have your answers? What are the Grey Rooms? To start with, I'm in hell. What gave it away? Conversations with Todd, actually. You people think too little of him. For whatever it's worth, I don't think he's a joke. I think he's a menace. But that's an issue for another day. Hmm. He helped me to understand the motivations behind your actions. To understand why you'd go out of your way to make the Grey Rooms inviting. To make your guests comfortable. Beautiful tapestries. Comfortable chairs. And high tea with my attendants. It's hardly the image of hell we mortals are sold. 
You don't want us in constant pain. You want something else. In the hearth porch, you told me that the older iterations of the rooms were less successful. That it wasn't until Raymond that you started to see results. What results? What is the project for? What's the key here, the fulcrum upon which all of this turns? Am I boring you? Not at all. I've learned during my time with you mortals how fortifying some ether in the system can be. And this conversation will require two, at least. Pour you something? No, thank you. Anyway, Todd's musings were quite helpful in focusing my search after I'd gotten into the study. You have some fascinating tomes in here. I'm glad they saw some use. Most of them just gather dust these days. So, what is the key? Why do we make the guests feel comfortable? I used to tell my children we are the choices we make. It was my way of making them think before they acted. To make them understand that their choices mattered. That they mattered. But here in the rooms, our choices mark us. Different from you. I learned in your tomes that we, mere mortals, can do something that you demons can't. We can choose. We have free will. To be evil. To be good. To make the world better or tear it down. Then that's not something you have, is it? Is it, Bob? No, it is not. You're called the Chained Ones by other creatures, I believe. You're all in service to some greater power. Your lives are not your own from the moment your existence begins. Or did I misunderstand? You understand correctly. Me, my people, we can't be anything other than what we are, how we were born. All of those beings in your books, they're all like that, aren't they? The winged servants of the mount, the ancient forest dwellers, the tentacled horrors of the far. Mortals, it seems, are the only ones who can truly chart their own course. That's the key, isn't it, Bob? Free will. The ability to choose. That's why you take us for the Grey Rooms. <sighs> yes. And those you take, David, Samantha, Todd, Raymond, what do we all have in common? Why us? What do you have in common? Oh, allow me. Raymond, our first guest. He was a pathetic, weak idiot. He killed his family and died in an electric chair with hatred and violence in his heart. Todd Mathis, a womanizer and sociopath, grew to hate the ruling class that governed his world and became the figurehead of a thriving terrorist network, died in his final act of sabotage, setting off a chain reaction that ended human habitation on his planet. Samantha Winters, an art student, swept up in the furor of a cult. She was touched by an eldritch power pretending to be a penitent god, and died after a centuries-long rule as Earth's cruel and unforgiving deity. And then, of course, Admiral David Beckett, a petty war criminal who became Admiral via a self-appointed title, the flourish of a narcissistic power-hungry dictator. You died, mourned by no one, a legendarily despotic emperor who held the twelve galaxies in his fist. You are all psychopaths and sinners, destined for hell. 
destined to burn. But not... <clears throat> but not here. Isn't that right? No. Not here. We were waylaid. Taken for the project. Yes. So then, we're here to choose. Stolen from our proper torment to open your doors and die your deaths again and again. Insane. Maddening. The more I read, the more I understood. But... But why? To what end? What's the goal? What's to gain? I knew you'd be here soon, that you'd find me. I stood just there, Bob, staring at your stacks of journals. And I knew I had to take a chance, a risk. So I threw them all to the ground, looking for your first tome, your first notes. I thought perhaps by going back to the beginning I might finally understand. And there it was. One of your original entries. One of the very first things you wrote down after joining the project. We are cosmic fishing lures cast out into the darkness. Our choices propel us between worlds. To the locus as Alma and the architect arrange. And there, every single man, woman, and child we encounter is what? Hooked. Snared by this infernal lobster pot you've created. The soldiers in that war trench. The mercenaries at Ice Station Bravo. That serial killer artist and all his victims. The passengers on the Greyfriars train. Nolan and his family. The crew of the Aurora Borealis. Even the little girl and her teddy bear. They're all here. Aren't they, Bob? Souls harvested by the power of the rooms and targeted by the choices we guests make. Behind all the mysteries, behind all the magic, the Grey Rooms are nothing more than a cosmic scam. A way to wring blood from a stone. Souls are your currency. And you've been using me to pickpocket the universe. But I'm just a narcissistic power-hungry mortal. Perhaps I've gotten it wrong. Bravo, Admiral. I truly do believe you are the first mortal to fully understand the project. We've taken pains to ensure even Todd doesn't comprehend the whole picture. So, well done. Thank you. Yes, well, I'm going to finish my drink. And then, with my apologies, I'm going to have to tear you limb from limb. What? Why? No mortal man is supposed to understand the project, Admiral. And the knowledge you've gained here today could very well impact our... What did you call it? Soul harvest. So, a few moments of agony and it will be all over. With luck, the Architect will be able to put you back together with some of your early memories on the project intact. It would be a shame to have to start over again. But, in the balance, in the balance, the life of one pitiful mortal is insignificant. Meaningless compared to the power we can wield. Thanks to the Grey Rooms. Unfortunately for you, Bob, I am not like other men. This crapping are the Naila. Mm. 
Sorry, attendant, but you won't be tearing anyone. Nice work, Dad. I rather think so, too. Don't worry, Bob. This little trick should wear off in a couple of hours. More than enough time for me to get to my door. Huh. I've never looked forward to escaping into a locust before. Strange how times change, I suppose. Oh, uh, one more thing, I think. Well, um... I think it's past time I met the architect. Don't you agree? Please, ask her if she'd be willing to sit with me after I return. I'm sure we'd have a great deal to talk about. Ask her politely, if you don't mind. Come, son. Death and the future. Awaits. Chapter 16, Intentional Death and Dismemberment Plan. The moment I stepped through the door, I could tell things were different. My confrontation with Bob had changed things. I had changed the Grey Rooms. Over the threshold and into the East Wing, without the pain or indignity of my previous returns. It felt... good. Welcome back, Dad. Be careful. Something's wrong. The lights were out. Darkness was thick around us. A first since my arrival in the sprawling old home. Samuel bore a nervous, furtive look on his face. What's wrong? I'm not sure. About ten minutes ago, all the lights went out. They must have been expecting me. I wonder what Bob told me. Welcome back, Admiral Beckett. Bob has told us... Well... Everything. Who is that? I think I know. Good evening. I assume I have the pleasure of speaking with the Architect. You assume correctly. It's a shame we've never had the opportunity to meet, madam. I've been a participant in your project for some time now. I hope Bob also passed along my request. I'd very much like to speak to you in person. He did, Admiral. It's intriguing. But then, so much about you is more than it appears to be. You're considering it, then? I am. However... You have been quite the unruly guest, sir. Poor Bob here. He's not having a very good week. You torture your own man. Why? I have very high standards, Admiral. And when they aren't met, Corrective measures are required. The same applies to you, unfortunately. 
Warden. Down the hall. Watch out! <gasps> what is this? A message. It's tied to that arrow buried in your shoulder. They are your choice of rooms for the day. Even under these circumstances, the project must continue, after all. Oh, you. You are saved. I choose. You are saved. How ironic. The clock starts now. In ten minutes, the warden will come looking for you. James. James. Better run. Better run. Better hide. <laughs> if you can make it to your door, you may enter. You will die, of course. But upon your return, we will sit down and have what I'm sure will be a very pleasant conversation. If the warden catches you, <laughs> I'm sorry to say your time at Ash Manor will come to a painful and ignominious end. What? Why? I'd be happy to answer that for you. But time is wasting, Admiral. Go, Dad. Run! I'm right behind you. Good luck, Admiral Beckett! <laughs> I ran, without thinking, without a plan, hunted by that abomination through a nightmare realm of never-ending corridors. My intellect and poise fell away. I was like any other man. I was afraid. Just a few minutes left. Tick -tock. My feet carried me through the halls, and I keenly felt every wound, every bruise I'd collected over my time in the rooms. If I'd understood Bob's notes correctly, maintaining the subject's body was one of the purposes of the project. But existing and thriving were two very different things. In life, I had taken pride in physical fitness, but now I was just an out of breath old man. My hand shook as I peered around at another corner. Where... Where are we? Do you remember the Green Lounge? It's close. I think we need to... Time's up, Admiral! My hair stood on end. I could feel it, a kind of electricity all around me. I closed my eyes, straining to listen. Straining. No. <laughs> it didn't work out, did it, Admiral? <laughs> Don't think of this as a reflection on you. Dad! Let me go. Let me go, you bastard! Just a rabbit dog. Got to put you down. Such a shame.
<laughs> Can't wait to see your insides again, Admiral. Even your blood is beautiful. <laughs> Let's get to work. Thank. Thank you, Warden. Oh? For what? This. This truly is a lot of blood. And as my son taught me, blood is power. <laughs> Valka Ar Cadris. He's down. Go, go. That's that's it. Are we hidden from their sight? We Yes. We're safe. For now. Oh, thank God. We should keep moving. They can't track you anymore, but you still need to get to your door. In a moment. I, I just... I just need to catch my breath. <sighs> Dad. We haven't... You and I haven't really had a chance to talk about what we heard. Your interview on Bob's tapes. Was it true? I don't know. I can't... I can't remember ever having that conversation with him. But there's so much I still don't remember. Where are you? Ah. Samuel. You said... You said you could magically recreate what we read and heard. Can you... Can you play back that part about your mother? Of course. Interesting. That you don't regret any of it. <laughs> no, man. Of course not. Why would I? I achieved everything I could have ever wanted. Every human world united under one banner. My fleet a symbol of strength, a shield to keep my citizens safe and secure. My grandfather began the work. My father set the stage, and in their names, I became Admiral Beckett, hero to the Twelve Galaxies.
Chapter 17 Opportunity Assessment Home again, home again. I strolled confidently back into Ash Manor, half expecting another assault, the sound of the warden's chains or the whistle of his blade. Instead, the hallways were quiet. The lights flickered in their usual charming way. Hey, Dad. Samuel was there, as always, waiting for me. He avoided my gaze, though, eyes cast downward. His demeanor was that of a man who was still wrestling with what he'd learned. What we'd both learned. Hey, yourself. Are you all right? I don't... I'm not sure. This has all been a lot to take in. It has. I still don't know if I believe it. I don't want to think that I'm the kind of man who... I let the thought trail off. He knew what I was trying to say. But both of us, I was sure, were thinking of the same thing. I was exactly the kind of man who would do what needed to be done. No matter the cost. <clears throat> Todd came through here a few minutes ago and left you a note. He was wearing some kind of weird uniform. There on the floor of the hall was a small square invitation. I bent to pick it up. <clears throat> As I did, I was quickly reminded just how eventful my last evening at the manor had been. I pulled back my coat to find a long purple bruise and a thin scar where my terrible wound had been. Grimacing, I carefully knelt to retrieve what Todd had left behind. Heavy stock and silver embossing lent the card an air of formality. My name was on the front, and on the back, well, it seemed the architect was good as her word. What is it? An invitation to tea. Hmm. I don't believe I've been to this part of the manor before. I looked up from the note and managed to catch his eye. I flashed him a weak grin. What do you say to drinks with the devil? We passed under an arch somewhere in the south wing, a doorway I was sure I'd never seen before. A sign on the wooden frame said simply, The Architect's Wing. Beyond the arch, many of the doors were twisted and bizarre. Several bore arcane sigils and glowing runes that made my eyes water when I glanced at them. Despite the directions, I found myself getting a bit lost. Samuel and I had stopped for a third time, trying to sort out where we'd gone wrong. Admiral! <coughs> um, Davy! Down here! Back along the hallway was Todd. I could see Samuel had been quite right. The old man was wearing a curious getup. A red jacket and slacks with a small black red hat perched atop his head. As we approached, I realized he wasn't leaning out of a door. It was an elevator. Todd. Good to see a friendly face. He wore an awkward expression, as if he wasn't quite sure what to say. We, oui, sir. <laughs> uh, glad you're all right. 
I didn't know there was an elevator in Ash Manor. Well, tell you the truth, sir, that nearly did I till this morning. I thought I was well done with this contraption. <sighs> Going up? I suppose I am. We stepped inside. Nothing about the elevator seemed to match the manor's decor. Faded carpet lined the floor, and tarnished brass fittings covered the walls. I felt a sort of crunch underfoot and glanced down. Dried blood. If I had to guess, matted hard into the pile of the carpeting. Delightful. We made the awkward ride together in silence. I tried a few times to start a conversation, but Todd finally had to shake his head, gesturing toward the ceiling. We were being observed. The elevator ascended up, and up, and up, far beyond the few stories of Ash Manor. When we arrived at our destinations, the doors opened to reveal an eerie sight. It was a restaurant, or had been. The tables were pushed to the far ends of the room and the chairs stacked one atop the other. Tablecloths had been repurposed as tarps to keep the furniture dust free. The only light came from the balcony beyond a set of glass doors at the far end of the room. Well, she's waiting for you outside, so just through there. Ring the bell when you're ready to go back down. And, uh, good luck, sir. Together, Samuel and I made our way across the large room. The strange lighting made shadows jump across the walls. There's something wrong with this place, Dad. Even stranger than the rest of the manor. A weird energy. Can you feel it? All I dared was a quick nod. Just enough to let him know I agreed. There was a sort of hum against my skin. An unpleasant sensation I'd never felt in the manor. I wasn't supposed to be here. I stepped out onto the balcony and tried not to gasp at the impossible vista that stretched out before me. A human city at night. Below, in the streets, I could see vehicles rushing along paved roads and people walking along strips of light-colored concrete. I could smell the exhaust from petromechanical burning transportation, and even at night, a haze of pollution hung in the air. Wherever we were, it wasn't the manor. Good evening, Admiral. I turned to see her standing to her full, impressive height. She was razor thin, her cheekbones like dull blades. Her skin was the color of rich copper, and ebony hair was drawn up into a sweeping set of curls. It was held in place by a tapered crown made of bone-white ivory. She wore a merlot red vest, black slacks, and boots that added several inches to her already impressive height. A golden pocket watch chain hung from her vest pocket. For some reason, I was immediately reminded of the first day I'd seen Alma. I'm glad to see my directions were easy to follow. Good evening, Architect. They were. And Todd was kind enough to carry me the last bit of the journey. Yes. He's quite... 
useful in his own way. Watching her speak was distressing somehow. I knew intellectually that the attendants weren't human, but both of them, Bob especially, took pains to act and appear as human as possible. The architect had no need for such vanities, it seemed. Her eyes were without pupils, flat black, nothing more than inky mirrors with which she regarded the world. She held herself rigidly upright, as if she was afraid she might shatter her frail human skin at any moment. For all I knew, she might. You're staring, Admiral. Ah, apologies. Might we sit down? Of course. I asked Alma to brew us some of that nice black tea. Would you care for some? Seated in her chair, she held up a steaming teapot with one hand underneath the body and one on the lid. It must have been scalding hot, but she didn't seem to register the heat. That would be very nice. If you didn't mind me asking, madam, we aren't in the manor here, are we? No. Still in the rooms, of course. But the restaurant and balcony were part of a previous version of the project. I quite like them. While it was running, I used to come up here to think and plan. One of the perks of being the project's architect. I've secreted away some of my favorite rooms. Bits and pieces of the project's past iterations. At heart, I'm... Sentimental, I suppose. How interesting. The... Artifice of the rooms. How they appear to us mortals. The castle, the hotel, Ash Manor. If you don't mind me asking, was that part of your process? Refining how to interact with the guests? Oh my. You were a busy boy. Yes, it was. We found over time that the mortal conduit's sanity was of paramount importance. Ah, uh, what did you call them? Cosmic fishing laws? Needed to be as functional as possible for the soul transference to work. That's why we've put more and more effort into the guests' surroundings. The grey walls of Raymond's prison cell were... functional. He was our first success, after all. And they are, as you may have guessed, how the project got its name. But the more we work to normalize and stabilize the guest's environment, the more success we saw, the greater the returns. I do go on, though. I adore my work, and I could talk about it for hours. As lovely as it is to be able to sit and share a cup of tea, we really should get to the matter at hand. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, of course. Your request to meet with me was... quite bold. Especially given the delicate state in which you left Poor Bob. Yes, well, I hope you and he understand what was merely self-defense. How... How is Bob? He's in excruciating pain, Admiral. We demons have extremely high pain thresholds. 
Not having a mortal body has certain advantages. But it means that when a member of my staff needs correcting, well, we have to go to some extreme measures to see results. She's tipping her chin down so that I could see my face reflected in those soulless black eyes. Staring. High standards, Admiral. Well, that's... That's something of a shame, then. He seemed to have the best interests of the project at heart. You are stalling, sir. I may be immortal, but I count the hours of my day as precious. Say what you mean to say, or I shall send you back to the rooms. She leaned forward, a predatory motion. You will not enjoy the experience. I looked past her shoulder to Samuel, a reminder of my strength, my confidence. He gave me a weak smile, one that didn't reach his eyes, but he set his jaw and nodded once. We had a plan, and I would follow through. Madam, I would like to formally request the opportunity to join the project as a member of the staff. Her head recoiled backwards, and her eyes went wide. Her hand stopped in midair where she'd been reaching for her tea. I had managed to surprise the architect. Excuse me? I know what the Grey Rooms are. What they're for. I think I can even manage some suppositions about your goals. But stop for a moment and think. Your staff is incomplete. You have learned scholars like Alma, patient and considered attendants like Bob. The Warden acts as your strongman, but you have no one on staff who truly understands the human experience. Todd is, of course, as human as I am, but with all due respect, madam, your opportunity for Todd to be of use to the project was lost. Thanks to an error in judgment, a terrible mistake. She had leaned back in her chair as I was talking. Her fingers steepled, her impressive eyebrow raised. To clarify, I was not yet with the project during Todd's time in the rooms. The error that resulted in the subject accessing a locus coterminus with their point of origin was corrected, with extreme prejudice. But I'm interrupting you. This is quite entertaining. Please, go on. I stood and walked out to the railing. Staring out at the skyline made it all a bit easier. The attendants have told me several times now that my time in the rooms has been a success. If I understood Bob's notes correctly, I've also had one of the longest runs the project has seen. Almost as long as Samantha Winters. I'm valuable, to be sure. But think of what I could offer you as an advisor. We could improve the guest experience even further. Stabilize the conduit, as you put it. Longer runs, more souls, even greater rewards. Whoever you report to, madam, I have to imagine. I turned back towards the woman expecting her to be in her seat, and was met with those black mirrors mere inches away. I started back, but lightning fast her hand rose from her side to grip my jaw and hold me in place. Long, thin, shockingly strong fingers held me like a vice. They were hot to the touch, and I could feel sharp nails prickling my skin. I stifled my reaction as best I could as she turned my face back and forth. She stared deep into my eyes, into my soul. I could feel sweat beating under my arms and along my brow as she forced me to watch my reflection in those inky pools. I held my breath as she considered me for long moments. Seconds that stretched and stretched 
And then I was free. I took a deep breath and a step back as she stood there, staring down at me. She nodded. Once. Despite some deep reservations about the concept of working with a mortal, your idea has merit. She strode away, pulling out her pocket watch as she did to check the time, then snapping it closed. For the moment, I will require you to continue your work in the rooms. Todd will have your choice for the day available on the ride back down. I have a meeting later today with the project's founder, and I will directly address the merits and obvious limitations of your notion. Given my receptive attitude and the generous wholeness of your person as we prepare for this encounter to end, I hope we can rely on you to for lack of a better phrase, play nicely for the time being. I blinked. So, that's a yes? That is an... I'll think about it. That is the best I can offer at this juncture, Admiral? That's... well... That's very kind of you, madam. I'll do my best not to stir up trouble as you deliberate. Very good. She glanced over my shoulder. Then for the first time since my arrival at the top, I felt an icy prickle of fear. Please tell the apparition that purports to be your son hello for me. I look forward to learning more about him as well. I glanced behind me to register the shocked look on Samuel's face. Behind me I heard a noise, and had the dim sense of a fleeing shadow. When I turned back, she was gone. In silence we crossed the dusty expanse between the doors and the elevator. I pressed the call button to summon Todd, and our return to Ash Manor. I looked back at the doors, and out to the city beyond, lost in thought. I... Uh, I'm scared, Dad. I wanted to tell him what I'd always told him. That Becketts were not like other men. That we had no reason to be afraid because of who we were, what we were capable of. But in that moment, I couldn't summon the words. And so I told him the truth. I am too, son. I am too. Chapter 18, Beckett's Bargain. We sat at the hearth porch, just the two of us, looking out over the manor grounds. I'd pulled up a set of chairs near the expansive windows, and Samuel sat by my side, his head bent in concentration over a book. I had the strongest memory from when he was a little boy. Every summer we'd go out to the countryside. My family's homeworld estate was a sprawling complex that covered acres of land. Riding stables, pools. We had wanted for nothing. This is just like the dock, isn't it? What? The docks. By the lake. At the country house. Oh, yeah. I see what you mean. That old swing bench Grandpa put up by the water. We'd sit there for an entire afternoon. Reading. Chatting away. 
Happier times. There had been no one to meet us. Just a slip of paper that had my choice of doors. And a thick black tome with a handwritten note as a bookmark. The tome sat open on Samuel's chair arm. Every once in a while I'd have to turn the page for him. With no one to tell me where to go or what to do, my feet had found their way back here. The table from our abruptly ended meal was still pushed back into the corner. Todd must have come back at some point to clear away the food. Did he? Did he have to cart away his own corpse, too? I wondered. Has this turned out like you expected? I don't know what I expected, son. But since the moment I set foot in the rooms, I knew. I knew I couldn't just accept a life of torture and imprisonment. Did I think on my first day I'd be asking the woman that ran the place for a job? <laughs> no. That I did not see coming. <laughs> I think I'm ready. If you are. The tome had been from Alma, of course. Her notes said that staff were no longer allowed to be in the manor with me. But she wanted to give me a chance to, as she put it, become whole again. Bob's notes on the cyclical nature of quests in the rooms had been detailed and disturbing. Subjects were slowly allowed to reclaim parts of their past through various means, visions, scenarios. The purpose of these memories, of course, was not to benefit the participant. They were tricks, hints to keep them engaged, to keep them seeking answers to half-remembered mysteries just out of reach. When the cycle was complete and their memories were whole, the subjects would be allowed just enough time to grow complacent. And then their minds were cleansed. We sinners... Murderers and criminals were made innocent again. Sent back into the rooms, fresh. I couldn't tell if I'd been through all of this more than once, but it seemed likely. Samantha Winters had walked the halls of her hotel through at least a dozen iterations of the project before her powers manifested. It stood to reason my situation was similar. It's a fairly simple incantation. I think it draws on something they've built into the rooms themselves. And we should have full control this time. Just tell me what you want me to do and I can bring you back and forth through your memories. Alright. I'm ready. <sighs> Here we go. Agatha Higresh Demon Memorium. Agra Bin Zesh. Enough. No distractions this time. Where to start? We... We have plenty of time for this, so... <clears throat> Show me my choice. Show me the moment of my victory. Captain Lorelei, what's our status? Admiral, welcome to the bridge. It's baffling, sir. The Faithless have sent the remnants of their fleet to meet us. They should be running and hiding. They're insane if they think they can take on the flagship. Hmm, you're right. And this battle formation, it's, it's all wrong. They're not positioned to attack a stronger target. What are they doing? I'm getting a report. What in the... What was that? The ship is stable. Damage crews are moving in. We... Sir, we have a problem. That was a main cargo bay depressurizing. One of the transport ships down there just blew the doors out from the inside and took off. Faithless saboteurs. Get it on the screen. Now. Bringing it up on the scope? There. Wait. That's not one of our transports. Sir, 
That's the Mudan! The ship my family and I came in on. Open a comms line. This is Admiral Beckett, pilot of the Mudan. Identify yourself. Go fuck yourself, David. Amanda? And Samuel? Absolutely. What the hell do you two think you're doing? <laughs> I'm making your grand campaign in one fell swoop, you bastard. Admiral, the Faithless Fleet is moving to create a screen for the Mudan. Time to interception is less than five minutes. We're defecting, David. I have a dozen drives filled with information from your private systems. All the juicy little secrets you tried so hard to keep buried. And I have dozens more, with fleet data going back as long as I've been in the service. It may not win the war tomorrow, but with all of this in the hands of the Faithless, in the hands of the people, your days are numbered. Why? Why would you do this? <laughs> you know, some part of me hoped you at least suspected. Well, I'm not even a very good actor. My flinch when you put your hands on me. My eyes cold and flat when I said I loved you. But Samuel was right. You're so blinded by your own brilliance, by the grand campaign your father waged all those years. It never even occurred to you that the family you bullied and locked away might want something more, might have their own opinions. I gave you everything. You were the political leader of a planet. I was a prisoner in a compound you had built around me. I spoke remotely to governors you appointed. I tried to turn your insane policies into something that our planet could survive. I had to ask your permission to see my sons. Sir, they're less than three minutes to the fleet. I don't... This is insane. Captain, move to intercept with Surin. Weapons, target a firing solution. Aim for the drive and disable the ship. <laughs> You're out of luck on that one. Damn it! Admiral, weapons are offline. Guess I can pull my own weight, huh, Dad? You. Goddamn both of you. I loved you. I trusted you. This campaign has been my family's dream since before my father was even born. You believed in it too once. I did. I was a different person then. A lot has changed. You've changed. I stopped pretending when you allowed Aldrich to die in a pointless border skirmish. When you sacrificed my oldest son for a chess move. You're a monster, David Beckett. You're going to burn in hell, and I'm going to send you there. Admiral, what do we do? They're almost to the fleet. Admiral? We are the choices we make. Captain, give me the helm. Aye, sir. Helmsman, make room. I didn't pause as the young woman hustled to get out of my way. I sat in her chair, my hands flying over the controls. I slaved power systems and defenses to my station using some tricks I hadn't employed since I was a cadet. As I strung together a simple series of executable tasks, somewhere far away I could feel the eyes of everyone on the bridge. I could feel the vein in my neck pulsing. But at that moment, my vision was like a dark tunnel, utterly focused. I would not allow this to happen. And there, my instructions were complete. I keyed the button, reconfiguring the shields, another press, and the power grid redirected the key systems at double strength. Another and the comms array came to life. Amanda, Samuel, I loved you with all my heart, but I will not allow you to take this from me. I may be going to hell. But you can tell them I'm coming. I entered the final command, and my flagship leapt into hyperspace. A micro-jump, 
one that covered a pathetically short distance, but it was enough. The Surin had appeared directly in the path of the Mudon, less than a hundred yards from its bow. I saw on my screen that Samuel had tried at the last minute to turn, but it was too late. They hit the shields at full burn. In a single moment, my entire traitorous family was dead. The drives and all their data, gone. My campaign was safe. My choice was made. Admiral, the Faithless are retreating. What should we do? I stood and swept my gaze across the bridge. Captain Lorelei was the only one who could look at me in the eye. Engineering. Reconfigure the ship for standard operations. Helm. Plot a course to pursue and engage. Weapons. Get those systems back online yesterday. The Faithless have left themselves open. And if I have anything to say about it, this war ends today. You heard the Admiral! Move! As my crew leapt into action to carry out my orders, I crossed the deck plates to the far observation wall. Out in space, I could see the debris from the Mudan spinning in the vacuum. Just more trash in the depths of space. A final choice on my path to power. On my path to the Grey Rooms. Chapter 19. What about Bob? The pain was what brought me back. I had been content to drift in darkness, but it was the pain that eventually pulled me back to the mortal form I had been wearing for the long years of Ash Manor. <laughs> Not done yet, Bob. Oh, no. No. Not even close. I did not open my eyes. I didn't have to. My hands and arms were bound by manacles, glowing with crimson runes. The results of Alma's competent spellcraft. I had no wish to see what the Warden had done to me. What he would do to me next. Time for another session with our little friend here. Tentacles, ooh, hooks, barbs, teeth. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we got what we needed last time, but... <laughs> need to be sure. He placed it on my cheek. This time, it pulled itself across my face with its pincers and positioned its tendrils on either side of my eye socket. <laughs> I wouldn't give him the satisfaction of a full-throated scream, but I couldn't help the noise I made. The mind worm burrowed through my eye and into my skull, where... Sorry, am I boring you? What? <laughs> I know we were getting a little technical there. Was I boring you with all that locust talk? I don't understand half of it myself, but those arcanists the founder brought together seem very on the ball. 
Oh. No. I suppose I'm still getting used to seeing you like this. The, the skin suit? <laughs> yes, well, someday we will have to fit you for one as well, my friend. We have big plans, big ideas for where we can take the project. I thought it would be helpful to understand their limited mortal frames, to better understand how to construct the space. A logical approach. And no, you are not boring me. It's an intriguing idea, and potentially lucrative, if I understand you correctly. It might be slow going off the start, but if we stick with it, I know this is going to mean big things for all of us. Where is this going to happen? Well, he has the whole six circle to work with. But we thought it would be best to keep things out of sight as much as possible. We've got workers carving out several large chambers in the western wall of Dis. If we have to expand, we have plenty of room to move around. I was under the impression this was intended to be a small operation. Off the books. Oh, oh, it is, it is. The workers will be disposed of afterwards. The spell work the Arcanists are doing will be sealed with their blood and bone. To start with, it will just be the Founder, me, and you. I understand the Founder's role, and you are overseeing the project. What exactly would I be doing? Keeping an eye on the subject. We're still narrowing down candidates. We need to be careful who we pull in. Don't want to take anyone too high profile, but... Once they're chosen, we'll get them in a holding chamber until the space is ready and all the loci are in place. You expect me to deal with mortals? <laughs> oh, don't worry, my friend. We're going to keep them in the chamber until the locuses are ready. Then you should just need to herd them towards the doorways. Like I was saying, their choice is what activates the soul trap. So unfortunately, we can't just have you picking them up and flinging them through the door frames. <laughs> as entertaining as that would be to see. Ensure a few meat sacks don't get out of line and be paid very well for the effort. You said the funding has already come through. We wouldn't have been able to afford the worker tithes without it. These barons on the upper circles think Hellfire comes out of their ass. It's not like the first few circles are hurting for souls, either. Know what I mean? I do. I do. Well then, what do you say? I don't suppose I could have some time to think about it. I tell you what. I'd like to. But if word of our little operation here gets out, well, I need you to say yes. And I need you to say it now. It's heaven, all right. Let the record show that prisoner 929494 chose door 823. The Great War. You've gotten soft. <sighs> I'm just doing what the Founder suggested. He's gotten soft too. Spent too much time with these fleshy sacks of shit. I'd point out between the two of us, you are the one that continues to wear the suit. I like the feeling when I squeeze their necks with these hands. <laughs> As I understand it, the more stable the subjects are, the more effective the project will be. That's what those arcane consultants seem to be saying anyway. So, I'm making an effort. A voice in the room. Ah, oh, there aren't even any razors in the floor this time. I know chasing them down endless corridors. It's worth giving it a try. <sighs> Just don't call that thing in there a guest. I don't care what the advisors say. It's a subject. A prisoner. And I don't want to hear otherwise. Do you understand?
Do you understand, sir? I... I'm sorry. Could you say that again? Oh, please, Nora, you got to help me. I think he's really going to hurt me this time. The Warden. Yes, the Warden. She really did a number on you, didn't she? I swear up and down the street, I didn't mean to help her. She just... I don't know. She put a whammy on me, Bob. The whammy? Yes, a, a spooky voice thing. Well, she told me to take her up to the club level and then... Todd, you little worm. Shit, shit, shit. The warden said I could explain. Feed you your tongue. Help that bag of skin escape. How dare you? I swear she got into me head. I didn't mean to. Warden, you know Todd did not do this with intent. And the elevator crashed because of you, not him. You defend this? He was doing his job, as was I. The fact that Miss Winters disrupted the flow of the project was not our fault. What were you doing, Warden? Were you doing your job? <sighs> <sighs> Alturia! Aldrash! Balakar! What was that? What did you do? I have temporarily discontinued management surveillance of this part of the manor. We do not have much time. You... why? Because I do not wish to see you do something or say something that will require us to expel you from the project. I can assure you, you would not enjoy the experience. Is that what happened to her? What happened to Samantha? Enough. Listen or don't, but let me speak. You must understand. Creating the Grey Rooms was a delicate, time-consuming, expensive process. To accomplish this, management sought out a number of powerful investors. I don't understand. And I can't explain. This third door. The same day that the voice spoke to you, there was an incursion into the rooms from beyond Ash Manor. We believe this interloper was a representative from one of the original investors. Why? To what end? I don't know. But it cannot be a coincidence that the third door appeared to you at the same time as this incursion took place. Me. They were here for me. Why are you telling me this? I stopped, looking away from the Admiral's anguished face. Why was I doing this? I knew what I told myself, but there was more to it, wasn't there? It was best to stick with the safe response. I have my reasons. You must understand. Todd is fetching the Warden. He will bring him here, and the Warden will torture you horribly. No. Please. Nothing can stop that from happening at this point, Admiral. Management cannot risk the possibility that you have been compromised. They must learn what you know, and they must learn it now. So what? You expect me to let the Warden carve into me, ruin me, to just smile and take it? No. I expect you to scream, Mr. Beckett, to make it convincing. You had no idea what was happening. You have no idea who the voice was. And, when the pain peaks, you tell them about your wanderings. My what? I know, Admiral. You've been using our gift to explore the manor, to find a means of escape. Tell him. Do not hold back. It will give them something to think about, something to chew on. Critically, your pitiful searching has nothing to do with the incursion, and so you will seem all the more innocent. Simply another clueless mortal trapped by the project. As desperate to escape as a moth pinned to a board. And just as harmless. You are one sick son of a bitch, Bob. Yes, I am. But I'm also the only sick son of a bitch that cares what happens to you. Now... What are you going to do? Oh, no! oh, oh, ah! <laughs> there it is. Uh, uh, uh.
Uh, don't worry. We can grow you a new uh, eye. Though I'm not uh, sure you'll want to. Uh, you look so beautiful this way. Uh, are, are we done here? <laughs> <laughs> yes, how we are. Which is good. Good timing. I'm to take you straight up the architect's office. Oh, and why is that? Uh, it's not her. The founder wants to see you, Bob. And he's not happy. <laughs> oh, no, he's not. <laughs> The Logs of Admiral Beckett was written by Michael Zenke, with performances by Eddie Cooper, Michael Turrentine, Graham Rowett, Alastair Mackey, Margaret Ashley, Chantal Jean-Pierre, Jason Wilson, Sarah Ruth Thomas, and Isabel Santiago. Musical composition for the Grey Rooms podcast by J.M. Scherf. Episode artwork, web development, and creative direction is by Cassie Pertit. Social media and Patreon management by Brooks Bigley. Videography is by Hale Scherf. Audio engineering and sound design is by me, Jason Wilson. Well, listeners, your time in this season of The Grey Rooms has almost come to an end. Next week begins our special two-episode finale where we can find out more about the futures of Beckett, Bob, the Warden, and others. We have worked harder than ever this season, and it shows through your belief in us and support of the show. We thank you for allowing us into your homes, ears, and hearts this season, and appreciate you helping us get where we are today. Of course, the fun's not over yet. Uh uh. <laughs> A special heartfelt thanks goes to our patrons, whose support has been paramount in the production and continuation of this show. You really mean more to us than we can express, and hope you all like the new things we've done this year, with plenty more coming in future seasons and in the off season. And if you haven't signed up yet, now is as good a time as any to receive bonus content such as our Patreon exclusive podcast Bane with episodes coming soon, exclusive artwork as well as being the first to know information about season four with early release of episodes. You can find out more by visiting patreon.com forward slash the gray room today and find the tier that works for you. We wish you all the best of health, wealth and happiness and can't wait to see you right here next week when we kick off the first part of our finale episode. Speaking of our patrons, we would also like to take the time to thank our patrons once again, and to any of those who have taken the time to leave us a five-star rating and review. Those reviews keep us at the top of the charts, and it makes it easier for more twisted souls to find the show. Patrons like Aaron Anthony, Amy Nikolai, Arthur Unk, Diver Ellie, Ellie Dowell, Ellen Houghton, Emily Cullen, Jackalbot Snows, Ronan Kumori, Jason Porras, Jeremiah Overstreet, Jessica Finch, Karina Sunina, Kay Davis, Kelly Bear, Klaus H, Kyle Wilcox, Laura Lupinetti, Lynn Browning, Lizzie B, Meza, Megan Pruitt, Michael Velez, Mike Devine, Mitch Garretts, Michael Philip BG, Paige Pie, Patrick Stewart, Plin Plin Plon all night long, Sean Gary, Shea Barbie, Sparky Anglin, Spirit Live, Stacy Thewis, Sybil McKinney, Talicia Gallman, The Original Nick Show, Molly Riefler, and Bruce Bollet. The Grey Rooms is also streaming for free on Spotify. Just get the Spotify app or open the browser and search The Grey Rooms. And we here at The Grey Rooms love our fans, and we want to give back to you in the best way that we know how. And we have a lot of fun things to show you, and we hope that you like them. And you can find out more by joining us on our social media platforms. 
You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, and YouTube. And we took your advice and extended an olive branch to all the tortured souls who have passed through the rooms. Our emotional support group on Facebook is always looking to help you with all of your needs. And don't forget about our merch store. It's full of epic designs and logos for you to sport, showing the world you are a survivor of these very rooms. All of this can be found in the show notes and on our website at thegrayrooms.com. And the fun always happens over on our Discord channel. If you haven't had the opportunity to join us there yet, you're missing out. You get the chance to meet Bob the Warden, authors, actors, and patrons, and listeners of the show like yourself. So hop on over there and join in the comical carnage and the truly in-depth conversation that takes place in our Discord community. It is literally the best community in all of Discord. We have this finale coming up, and it's a doozy. I can't wait for you to hear it. But there's still a lot of work needed to go into it. So we're going to go ahead and jump on back into that so we can always deliver the highest quality to meet your expectations. Thanks again for your support, and we'll see you next week.